Hey everyone, this is Lynn Bartim, and you are listening to the Apex Hour on KSUU Thunder 91.1. In this show, you get more personal time with the guests who visit Southern Utah University from all over, learning more about their stories and opinions beyond their presentations on stage. We will also give you some new music to listen to and hope to turn you on to some new sounds and new genres. You can find us here every Thursday at 3 p.m. or on the web at seu.edu slash apex. But for now, welcome to this week's show here on Thunder 91.1. All right, well, welcome in, everyone. It is Valentine's Day week or weekend here at SUU. uh, And I am joined... It's not really a Valentine theme, but we are here to talk about like the greatest book I've read in a long time. And um, that is by author Todd Peterson. And the book is Picnic in the Ruins. And then we also have Dr. Kyle Bishop here in the studio to join us to just have a conversation about books and writings and all things literature. So welcome into the studio, guys. How are you today? Great. Great. Yay. Pleasure to be here again. Yeah, thanks for having us. Awesome. Well, Todd, I'd love to start with you. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about kind of, you know, who you are and what you did do in relation to SEU, and then a little bit about who you are as an author. Well, I teach in the English department, and I kind of uh, am split into two selves there. I teach uh, creative writing classes, um, and I teach in our screen studies program. So I'm kind of split between the writing side and the literature side of things and then uh, teach film theory and screen aesthetics. And I'm going to teach a class this fall in a heist movie, which will be a, is kind of a tie in for yes. this book. Yeah. Um, which has got this kind of criminal theft um, aspect to it. And as a writer, um, I've kind of been uh, this is my fourth book. So I've been writing fiction for a while. But this is this book, Picnic in the Ruins, marks a turn a little bit towards uh, writing crime and suspense and thrillers. And it's just been a gas to kind of work in that space and to join all these other great writers um, who've kind of kept us entertained, but also kept us thinking about the the dark element of society <laughs> through criminality and all that stuff. So. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to ask you more about that because... I, I'm curious about the book and how it might be a departure in a new sort of area for you. And it is just so engaging and it does have this crime element to it, which I can't wait to get into more. But before that, Kyle, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do at SCU. And I know you just finished Picnic in the Ruins as well. Yes. Uh, so I'm currently the department chair in English uh, and I have been working with Todd since kind of the beginning of of my career. And uh, we both work in the film program and have worked together to develop those courses. I also teach American literature, and uh, I've had opportunity to teach some more regional literature that is uh, in tune with this one, with this piece by by Todd. And uh, my my presence here today is largely because uh, by having adjacent offices and frequent lunch rendezvous. Uh, I've been in tangentially involved with this novel since the very beginning when it was under a different title and with oh. a slightly dramatically different plot. And so I very much enjoyed watching this come from the germ of the idea to the published novel over, it feels like 10 years, <laughs> maybe a little more. That first version, it's been there a while. I mean, I, I, I sold Picnic in the Ruins as Picnic in the Ruins uh, in 2016. So oh, yeah. it's been in this form since then, but boy, it takes a long time to get this stuff done, doesn't it? And you guys have known each other for a long time. I, I can imagine that you've had so many great conversations about not just this book, but about writing in general. So it's really fun to have you guys both here. Let's get into figuring out. I want to know a little bit about the story. Well, maybe let's start out with a b- brief synopsis. I mean, 
gosh, the words that come to mind are like, you know, like, like you said, like almost heist crime adventure, Southern Utah, there's archaeology, there's German, you know, tourists and, and, and a deeper thread about, um, artifacts and, uh, land ownership and provenance. And I mean, it just seems like there's so much in here. Tell us a little bit, maybe give us a little thumbnail. Well, about I'll cop book. out a little bit and read from the jacket copy off the back because okay. I love what they did with it. Uh-huh. Um, I just have the, a, a sort of marketing dream team. And so they, they kind of help see things and put it together for the first time for me this way. So it says, anthropologist Sophia Shepard is researching the impact of tourism on cultural sites in a remote national monument on the Utah-Arizona border when she crossed paths with two small-time criminals. The Ashdown brothers were hired to steal maps from a collector of Native American artifacts, but their ineptitude has alerted the local sheriff to their presence. Their employer, a former lobbyist seeking lucrative monument land that may soon open up to energy exploration, sends a fixer to clean up their mess. Suddenly, Sophia must put her theories to the test in the real world, and the stakes are higher than she could have ever imagined. What begins as a madcap adventure across the RV-strewn vacation lands of southern Utah, that's, I love that sentence, Yes, uh, becomes a meditation on mythology, authenticity, the ethics of preservation, and one nagging question, who owns the past? Yeah, that is exact. I mean, there's just so much in it. But where did this idea start? So when you and Kyle were talking in the hallway, you know, before, how, where did it come from? So, so I had this idea for a book that was earlier this, and two of the characters survive in it in in their own ways. There's a a Japanese video game designer named Kenji. Yes. Um, and there's a German tourist named Reinhardt. Yes. Um, and originally there was a story that uh, that that I was working together, maybe as a novel, maybe as a screenplay called They Very Cowboy. And it's just about the intersection of uh, a German, and they call them Indian enthusiasts, right? There's a whole subculture of Germany that is absolutely enamored of and fascinated with the Native American. Um, and then I wanted to have him cross paths with a Japanese guy because there's a huge Japanese country and Western subculture. And I thought, wouldn't it be easy, if, interesting, if we took the two Axis powers ah. and had them meet in the United States... And then kind of have an adventure, you know, maybe like Thelma and Louise, where they're just moving across the American West, kind of living through the illusion of what we project as the American West. So I had that for a long time. And then when my agent and I got talking about a book to do, I kind of pitched him that idea. And he said, well, one of the things I'd like to suggest for you is I notice in you a tendency to write about a certain kind of criminality in the first book that I did um, that he represented and sold for me. And I didn't see it in myself. And he said, like this and like this, and he was pointing me to like um, Elmore Leonard and William Boyle and some other writers. Um, and he, and I thought for a minute, what? And then I realized, oh man, yeah, I get it. Some of my favorite things are exactly what he's talking about, this kind of humorous, weird, cur- quirky, dark, crime and this is something that kyle knows really well about me uh, because we're both this way we're huge coen brothers fans Uh, like ridiculous uh, and when i realized oh wait a minute i never thought of a lot of the coen brothers work as crime but i would say 75 percent of all of their stuff has at the core i mean even the big lebowski has a kind of a criminal activity in it and i started to explore that and i said oh wait a minute this is something i did not know about myself but my agent did and so I really just kind of turned to face it in this book, and I had a blast. Oh. And the next projects, even the next couple of ones that I'm imagining, are kind of going down that line because it's so much fun yeah, uh, to work in that specific genre and to attract those kinds of readers because crime fiction readers are, I mean, they read tons and they read all the time and they're great fans. It's just, it's remarkable. So yeah. that's that's how that came together. But also, I mean, you live in southern Utah for even just a little bit, and a lot of the things that are in this book kind of pop up. Yeah. Um, And I tried to do my best to write a book that would be like what what would happen if you just passed through these spaces and saw what you saw and experienced what you experienced, whether it was at Bryce Canyon or down on the Arizona Strip. Um, Even though this says this is kind of down there, I tried the MASH trick. You know, the old television show, MASH, it's supposed to be about Korea, but it's actually about Vietnam. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, 
to avoid one of the big problems that a lot of people talk about with sensitive cultural sites, like the minute you write about them or share about them, anything about them, you start attracting attention. And that's a theme in the book. Yes. So I tried to write it in a neutral space where it wasn't quite exactly where the things really are. Yes. Because the minute you start sharing about that, it hits Instagram Mm -hmm. and, uh, or Twitter or whatever. And then people flood these sites and then they become damaged. So I kind of wrote it in a space that's, Maybe like an alternate universe version of Southern Utah yeah. that's really close, yeah, sixty percent of the time, and then it's it's manufactured or invented from other other things and other parts of the state or Arizona. I mean, even the Bryce Canyon part has like I was like, oh, that kind of sounds like Zion, that kind, you know, and so it's it's all there. It, it's you sort know. of meant to be anchored and then let the invention yeah. fly mm-hmm. from that anchoring. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let's get into the characters a little bit and. Um, I'd love that, you know, you mentioned the German tourists, which, by the way, I had no idea that there was this uh, German enamored enamoration with, um, you know, American Indian culture or native culture. Um, and so that was fascinating. And it's so depicted in the book. But let's talk about that German character. And um, I think, Kyle, you got involved in some of the, the that part early on, right? Yeah, that's where I got to contribute some of my life experiences because in, in Germany, their, their reverent awe of the Native American culture transcends what we would consider appropriate. Oh. <laughs> They're not particularly politically correct. And so in my uh, travels through Germany, I've, I've seen uh, grown German men wearing headdresses wow. and, and houses full of uh, Coco Pele level marketed paraphernalia. And so uh, and Todd had kind of unearthed that on his own, and I was able to kind of backfill a little bit with personal experience. And then we kind of brainstormed a little bit like we do, just throwing ideas back and forth to come up with with this really kind of quirky name. Because I knew a guy named Kupfer who was just strange as all can be, but really memorable. And, and it was a name that I have never seen before or since. It means copper, but it's not a common name. Uh-huh. And then Reinhardt, especially if you say it in the German, it's such a great Germanic name. Um, you know, the, the, the sense of him as, as kind of a, the heart of the novel, the moral yeah. center in some ways through his, his naivete. Yes. Um, and so I, as a reader and also as a literary critic, I very much enjoyed reading the novel as not a book that my friend wrote, but as a work of literature and, and trying to see the elements of storytelling that are in there. And what Todd does that's so wonderful and postmodern is Reinhardt is also simultaneously the literary critic of the book in which he exists. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of people will find uh, much joy in his, his quest to have a quest. Yes. Yeah, and he certainly has a quest, and he has a book about a quest <laughs> as well, right? There's there's layers upon layers. Yeah, his layers. Own, owner's manual. I mean, and this is one where the crossover comes, because both of um, Kyle and I, um, we, we teach Joseph Campbell's monomyth and this idea. It's really central to how Hollywood has tried to structure films. It's uh, There's a sense, and there's a lot of debate that surrounds it. Like, is this really, like, good cultural anthropology um, that we find ourselves in the critical theory of our own discipline. And so part of it's a challenge of that. But uh, And I don't think it's uh, spoiling anything. Reinhardt comes across a book called Myth Structures for Blockbusters. Yeah. And as he starts reading this, it's one of these Hollywood screenwriting guides yeah. that says, oh, at the beginning of your quest, you'll have a call to adventure. And at the um, you'll also then have a refusal of the call to adventure. And then he, he s- ceases to know which came first, the chicken or the egg. Did Is he having a quest or did he read about the quest and now he's imprinting that experience onto his own experience? And he starts driving everybody insane by insisting that we're all participating in a large monomyth. And, and uh, I just thought that there's a lot of comedic possibilities for someone who keeps on saying, I've just crossed this first threshold. Right. Or is this the first threshold? <laughs> yeah. Or or when is that actually going to happen? Um, so that you could get the sense that what he was really trying to do was write the script for his own life. And then I tried to let that be, hey, maybe one of the things that happens with cultural appropriation is sometimes we try to write our own story over the top of the stories of other people. Mm-hmm. And I kind of let that be a little bit of what happens because the the Indian with their 
uh, I'm sorry, the the German with their enamored yeah. state about Native Americans really maybe aren't always appropriate, or, yeah. or maybe they appropriate. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to ask that question, but from a perspective that felt that it was a subject position that was legitimate for me. Mm-hmm. As a white guy of Germanic decision uh, of descendants, my grandparents were Herwigs. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like I could say, you know what, this is this is how I want to unpack maybe a little bit of what what my culture has done here, mm-hmm. um, because it felt like that was appropriate for me to be able to challenge or unpack. Um, there are other writers who do other things and from other perspectives, but this is the one that I felt like I could uncover and work with. That is so cool. And one of the things I also wanted to ask you regarding characters is that um, I, I don't know if it's now that I've lived in Southern Utah for so long or whatnot. I just felt like there were um, people that I know everywhere in this book, you know, <laughs> and it was in. And, and I wondered, you know, how specific you get <laughs> with the personalities that, you know, and the people, you know, putting it in or is it more you know, a, a little bit more obscure, um, you know, yeah. tell me a little bit more about that in relation to the characters. Well, part of me wants to say a gentleman never tells. <laughs> right. um, That's true. I get but, it. But in order to get the effect that I think you can get from a reader, which is that they want to feel a connection, you simultaneously have to be super detailed and then you can't be super detailed. Right. So if you, I mean, I would say this, the good term is they're amalgamations. Yeah. So okay. many of the people are like five or six different kinds of people that I know or types or combinations. Because I, I kind of like pastiche. Yeah. I like to pull, there's a character that comes later named Dreamweaver. Oh, who is sort of like awesome. partially some people that Kyle and I have met when we've gone to do a sweat lodge ceremony down in Pipe Springs with a friend. And then also sort of part like, the dude from the Big Lebowski yeah. and part um, like some of these quirky characters that show up in Thomas Pynchon novels. And so I try to like almost like musicians like that sample and all that other kind of stuff yes. to bring all these things mm-hmm. together and you feel a sense of familiarity with it. But it's really kaleidoscopic or a mosaic mm-hmm. maybe of lots of different people. And so lots of people have said, oh, I get I feel this total connection with this character and they'll describe what they feel. And it's absolutely different than the somebody else who a couple of days ago mm-hmm. told me they had an absolute connection with this character, but for different reasons. I and love so that, that comparison. And so that prismatic sense is something that I tried to work on a lot. Yeah. Borrowing from all over. Well, I would add that that's also where your affection for the Coen brothers comes to play. Because oh. they're notorious, uh, very effective for casting non-actors in um, bit part roles. And so they find really unusual people with lots of flavor. And I see that in in the entire supporting cast of this novel, that there are amalgamations of people. Some I recognize because I traffic in similar circles with Todd. Uh, but they're, they're quirky in that they're so odd, they can't be anything other than real people. Yeah. Because they're not um, stereotypes or, or, or even archetypes. Even, right. I mean, some are. But to a certain extent, they're just odd. Yeah. And um, I know that, that the, the Cohen films influence Todd quite a bit as they do me, but there's um, my, some of my favorite uh, moments are inspired clearly by raising Arizona uh, meeting Fargo, uh, particularly in the bumbling criminal mastermind brothers. Yes. Uh, I say that with quotation marks. <laughs> um, am I wrong? Oh, absolutely. I, one of the things I like, the Coen brothers do this, they like pairs, and I like to have pairs. I, I kind of built the novel on a series of pairs. And so right. there's the brothers, uh, there's Reinhardt who meets up with a character, Sophia, and they're paired and they walk together. Mm-hmm. Sophia then is also paired with a ranger. Yeah. And so I like to put the pairs together and then reform the pairs. Uh-huh. And so that at, at various points in time, like the sheriff travels with an old lady right? and, and just let those pairs mostly because pairs are interesting to me because you get to do the oppositional stuff in there. How do you match someone with someone who's their perfect foil? But then for me, the conversations are what's the most important. And I think I probably say I write novels so that I can write dialogue Mm. so that I can write these kind of crazy weird things that everybody says. But I think that that's a lot 
that's in the Coen Brothers movies. It's what I like in Tarantino movies. I, you know, all of the sort of high violence moments of like Pulp Fiction are not as interesting to me as Royale with cheese. Yeah. Right. And those, those kinds of conversations that, that is so much fun for me. Um, but I th- yeah, I think he, he's absolutely right where there's, where there's that source material. But the, here's how the sausage gets made. And it's really fun to say this um, on our own campus radio station. I got funding from the provost's office years ago when I started this to take a week and drive around through this area. So oh. I just went with a notebook and my phone and took pictures and listened to conversations and sucked it all up. So when I came back, just from those encounters, I built a lot of the scenes that oh, were here. Wow. And just and so what I'm hoping to do with future projects is to go back and say, hey, th- this is maybe a little bit about how my creative process works. Yeah, I go... I get an idea of what I want to do, and then I go in and find these details, whether it's a, a person or whether it's just a sign or a part of the building, like the tape mm-hmm. X's on yeah. the windows yeah. across the street from a trailer park. I saw that yeah, and took took a picture and a note and said, I want to pack this in to the writing. And so I hope that that's part of what helps people who read it feel like this is really accurate to what I've seen, yeah. even though it's really an invention and it doesn't exist anywhere. Exactly. That's exactly how it feels. Well, that is so cool to learn about that. I, I mean, I have to play a song because, um, you know, that's what we do, but I could just keep going and going because I, I, your dialogue, I want to ask you about that. I want to ask you about the research. I want to ask you about um, the, 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 the land rights part of this and all of that. So when we come back, we'll continue talking. We are here with author Todd Peterson and uh, also SEU faculty member, um, Todd Peterson and Kyle Bishop, both SEU faculty members. We are talking about Picnic in the Ruins. You're listening to the Apex Hour, KSU Youth under 91.1. The first song I have for you today is The Scorpion's Winds of Change, which <laughs> makes a little appearance in the book, I think, if I remember right. Yep. And um, I just thought, you know, we got to we got to have a little scorpion. So here we go. You're listening KSU Youth under 91.1. Down to Gonky Park Listening to the wind of change An August summer night Soldiers passing by Listening to the wind of change
storm wind Then we ring the freedom bell For peace of mind All right. Well, welcome back to the Apex Hour. This is Lynn Vartan. You're listening to KSU Thunder 91.1. That song was the ever famous Wind of Change by the Scorpions with the famous whistle in it. Um, and that is one of the songs that is mentioned in the book, Picnic in the Ruins, which is written by Todd Peterson, who is my guest in the studio today, along with Kyle Bishop. Welcome back, guys. Thank you. Thank you. We were talking over the break about one of the the um, devices that you use in the book that is so fun and interesting, and you were giving us some great insight to it that I hadn't um, really even considered, which is every one of your... Uh, chapters has these um, very short phrases, uh, one or two words uh, that have to do with the chapter somehow. But when you first read them, you have no idea what they are. Can you share with us a little bit about that? So I'll just read you from uh, the chapters are superimposed by day. So it'll say like, it really means chapter one, but it'll be like day one. And yeah. So this is for day three. And it says fake news, far from the matting crowd. A time of reinvention, death by PowerPoint. Oh, death by PowerPoint. I, I just, when I first read that, I was like, I can't wait. What is that? What does that even mean? And so each one of those is, is meant to be almost kind of like the, the, a sub chapter mm -hmm. title or a, a sub heading or naming the beats. This is pretty common mm -hmm. in screenplay language. Blake Snyder's um, Save the Cat or other kinds of things that help writers structure stories. But I wanted to play around with that in a way that maybe doesn't seem like it has any meaning at all or it seems random, but they actually are these kind of like what is a kind of a core idea or maybe a thematic um, call out, pop out that could be for mm -hmm. each of those moments. Mm -hmm. And they don't correspond entirely to scenes, but they kind of mostly do to the clusters of stuff that build across because sometimes you'll see this um, – uh, Cormac McCarthy does it in Blood Meridian. It's in the Bible oh. um, when, you know, they put those chapter headings in there that, that kind of um, summarize stuff. But it all is supposed to be meaningful and, and so forth. But I wanted this to be kind of like a cipher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's a mystery, right? And you're supposed to be right. trying to figure out what's going on. I like it as a cipher idea. That's a, that's a cool way of thinking about it. Kyle, you had some strong feelings about those titles. How did you feel about them? Well, because I, I, I'm such a structuralist that um, – I found them fascinating, but also a little consternating because I, I wondered if these are subsection titles, why aren't they broken into the subsections? And then I would, I would get frustrated with myself because I would forget them as I read the chapter. And then I would hit things where I would go, wait a minute, he told me this was going to happen. Um, and so then I'd go back to him. But my favorite bit of, of these kind of epigraphs is they're cheeky. Yes. Um, and they often have their plays on existing titles and other references. 
And the book is just jam packed with pop culture references and other, uh, postmodern referentialities. Um, dare I say it's, it's got Easter eggs galore for, yes. for people, especially, um, Star Wars fans. Yeah. I remember the, the, the one Princess Leia, uh, commentary and, you know, just there's a quick, uh, sort of riff back and forth between two people about Princess Leia. And I, it was really kind of a fun moment. I That's thought. That's General Organa now. Exactly. She's a general now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> but that's, and I do that a little bit to just satisfy myself, but I really love, uh, what do they call these things now? Like community and the Simpsons that they're, they're referent referentiality shows or mm. citation shows. And so it's kind of a, a real contemporary storytelling technique mm. to pack things in there and to reveal a little bit of the, how the sausage is made. And so yeah. that there are parts of the original that's in there. One of the big influences for me on this is the show community yeah, that would really try to parody things, show homage. And, mm -hmm. and it was up to you to be a savvy watcher to go, wait a minute. Right. Is this good fellas? Are they doing good fellas yeah. in this show? And then you kind of follow that hunch and you go, Oh dang, they really are. Yeah. And I think that that's a kind of layering that maybe is like a late capitalism 21st century thing where we like to do that. We like to hear the bits and pieces. I, I'm a big music fan. I love it when a musician will cite another m melodic passage. I mean, and this is done in high modernism, you know, when composers will borrow from like Russian folk right. songs or right. whatever. And it's up to you to know that this is happening. Yes. And so that's what I really like to do, maybe to keep myself occupied, to make yeah. sure that it's like, hey, let me show you a little bit about where the influences come from on this. Now, when you're, do they just freely get in there or do you, is it a conscious effort to put them in there? Do you go in after the fact? Like, how does that part of the process from a technical standpoint work for you? Well, I didn't have it originally broken out that way and I decided to start playing. And I, and I feel like this book was really maybe my most playful book. Um, I just wanted to let myself try stuff out and see if it worked. And yeah. so I tried one and I thought this worked out. Yeah. And then I started trying it again. And I had ones that were kind of uh, hit and miss. And once I present them to my editor then, and she's great, Jenny Alton. Oh my gosh. She really helped get everything uh, lined up and going in, this, in the same direction. She would kind of come in every now and then go, mm, well, <laughs> on this and kind of other parts. And then I would come back to where I was playing around and then maybe get it, get things right, you mm -hmm. know, kind of dial it back a little bit or maybe amp up something over here. And so that process went through. Once I sort of caught how it worked, then it started to catch. I so by see. the end, I was really sort of able to pull them out. Early on, I was like, I don't even know what tone I want to strike with this, but let's just try some things. Okay. Sometimes I did ones that were really literal. It turned out that the ones that work best were a little bit more oblique. And so I just said, let's just try that. Oh, cool. I also wanted to get into, I mean, the book is just chock, I mean, chock full of research. I mean, you must have, uh, I mean, everything from specific um, land ownership things to the Paiute language to, uh, it just seemed to me that there was a lot of research. And I was curious about that and some of the things that you learned and how you sort of, um, you know, got all that knowledge. It's really fun to have this conversation today because I just got approval from Andy Kamen in the library to have to bring a librarian into one of my creative writing classes in the fall. Oh, cool. Because this, this was such a big part of this book. I wanted to start working on teaching my students how to be able to do this research, which is a little bit different than if you're doing a research paper. Right. You're kind of right. You're doing research to generate new ideas. Oh, okay. Um, and so uh, it takes a little bit different skill set. And we're really lucky. Christopher Clark over in the library He's has so got awesome. an MFA. He's a writer, librarian. Yeah. Um, some of my friends on Twitter were making Repo Man jokes about um, having this kind of combination librarian who can in there, be in there. So it's, it's really an interesting thing that we don't talk about so much when we teach. Mm -hmm. Like, what does it take? So I would start with a, I started with a rough idea that I wanted to have some guys stealing pots. So the very first thing I did was I just went around and I met with um, one of the professors we used to have here who's no longer here as it was an anthropologist. He sent me to two master's theses about pot hunters. Oh. So I read those master's theses, uh, got that advice, and I said, oh, 
I thought it was X, but in fact, this research is showing me it's something else. And so then from there, I, you know, just like we do, we teach our students, I kind of went into their work cited pages and yes. their bibliographies and started to pull that research out. I, I'm absolutely not an anthropologist by any stretch of the imagination, but it was really cool to kind of go in there and kind of dig down into this. And so over the, for about four years, I was just reading, I don't think I read like any fiction. Uh. I was reading all about what happens when there are these kinds of encounters um, with cultural resources, with antiquities, with a theft um, and then part of it was cultural work. I knew I was going to be writing about these antiquities that belong to Native people. Um, and so I, I've had conversations with Native people. But then part of what that you talk about in this world of cultural appropriation is we've all got to do our own work. Mm-hmm. And that it's maybe not even 100% appropriate to go to people of color or indigenous people or anything like that and say, hey, I'm working on a project. You start telling me all the things I need to know. So I really kind of took that um into my process when I kind of learned that and realized, you know what, it's going to just take some legwork. I had great help from Special Collections. Paula Mitchell guided me in so many amazing directions. Uh, Again, and like I said, I've had uh, conversations with um, Paiute tribe members, um, with friends of mine who are Navajo, um, about their thoughts and feelings about interacting with these places and really tried to make sure that I was balancing what I could learn on my own, with what I could learn being in conversation with other people, talking with everybody, map makers, archaeologists, wow. um, friends of mine here in the national parks. And yeah. at various times they said, now, it, this is a fictional book that you're writing, right? And I said, <laughs> well, it's starting to prove to be otherwise. Like, yeah. I would just imagine something and then go do research and find out that that was really what was going on mm. and then some. Yeah. The thing that's other that's weird about this too is a lot of what this is about was kind of some immediate stuff that was happening in the political sphere with the uh, retraction of Bears Ears, right? Um, and then the ideas of the possible expansion. And this book was done before there was an administrative change, right? And so it was written basically thinking about the trajectories that we had under the system that we had previously. And so the book talks about that system. Um, and it would be a different book if I wrote it now with mm-hmm. Deborah Holland uh, as the Secretary of the Interior, first Native American, right. to have that position. We, we're probably going to see a different set of um, procedures and interactions because she has a different perspective that she wants to bring yeah. than we've had in the past. But she also wants to involve other people, too. So the world shifted underneath me as this book was going in, and, and that's fantastic. I'd like nothing better than to know that um, some of the things that I write about as a matter of political concern in the book are kind of being remedied at this point, we hope. Knock yes, on wood. I know, right? Um, yeah. Well, one of the things that, that's so interesting is we touched on at the beginning, and I wanted to ask Kyle what he thought is, uh, it, it sounds a bit that this, this book has been a pretty significant departure for you as an author. And then, uh, Kyle, I'd love to get your perspective, knowing Todd's writing and knowing his previous works, what do you think about it as an evolution? How has, mm. how does this book represent a, a change or evolution or, or what's different? What's new? Yeah, I have been uh, able to kind of follow his trajectory as an author and not as much as his good wife, of course, but I have seen a, a kind of a, a maturation and development in, in his concerns. Some things um, of Todd Peterson author remain pretty constant. He's mm-hmm. he's character driven. He's oh. really um aware of people oh. uh, and and not boring people. And the other is what we've already mentioned is his dialogue, his ear for dialogue and his referencing. So much of the dialogue is how Todd talks. Yeah. Um his his common speech is peppered with uh, references and uh, cultural appropriations and <laughs> puns and jokes and pop culture references and all that kind of stuff. So, so much of that is in there. Um, as I've had the opportunity to travel with Todd to conferences, study abroad, um, trips around the Southwest, he does. He takes photographs of everything and he whips out notebooks and writes things down when we overhear stuff. And he shushes me in restaurants because he's eavesdropping. And um, he puts all kinds of things. And there is an old adage that you don't want to annoy a writer because you'll end up 
in a book someday. Yeah, exactly. And he does all of that very much. Um, what I would say about this book is there's a maturation of plot complexity. Mm. Uh, I like his short works a lot, and I like his previous novel quite a bit. Um, it needs to look like we tried because it's interwoven shorter works uh, that creates something of a tapestry of a larger narrative. This is the larger narrative, but it's still broken up into these quieter, isolated moments. And so you could approach this book, like a lot of great um, writers, as a collection of shorter pieces, mm -hmm. character sketches that intertwine. He has a, he has a section that engages with uh, the FLDS community that yes, by itself right. functions very effectively as a story. Yes. Um, but it's like a story that we drop into in the middle of and then we leave before it's resolved. And so one of the writers, and I've told him this and we've talked about this, um, he's really channeling, in addition to Cormac McCarthy and Coen Brothers screenplays, he's also channeling Cather substantially uh -huh. and, and her somewhat character sketch driven, um, short story collective novel structure. And so I do think his, his previous work is, Wonderful. But this book is, uh, marks um, a, a literary sophistication and a, and a marketing um, progression where I think this is the novel that's going to give him a, a wider audience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's so true what you say about the, the very short stories and they just sort of swirl around each other closer and closer. I mean, you know, they start out sort of more orbital and they sort of, you know, get closer and closer and swirl around and it's just so fun. And then, and then these episodes in the middle, like you said, with the, with the FLDS community and a, a real inside look to, I mean, even just that, the house that they stay the night in and all of that, I was just all in. I was completely all in. It's just so fun. So that was just really cool. And, and so they are like that and they just keep getting closer and closer and closer, which is so cool. So and that was one of the things I wanted to do. We think of plots as these kind of linear things, but I wanted to, and Kyle and I've talked about this a lot. I think I've even done some academic work on the convergence narrative uh -huh. where things are coming from all these different places and they just meet yeah, and go boom and kind of get heavy enough to drop down through and like deflect the gravity yeah. of something. And that's what I was really shooting for in this narrative in particular. Like, how are these people connected? Oh my gosh. And then once I think readers start to get this idea that everybody's going to converge at some point, um, we won't talk about that because that's like no. the big part. But um, Kyle's also helped me a lot. He's really big in narratives at looking at the midpoint. Mm. And so usually we talk about this inverted check mark for plots that's going to go this way, and maybe at two thirds or three quarters of the way is when the climax happens. Oh. So there's room for a denouement. But Kyle's talk about midpoints got me really thinking about what I could do to use the midpoint of the novel. So I do work towards a couple of climactic events, but that midpoint was really important. And that's when a, a big perceptual shift about what was going to happen. There's a certain kind of plot that happens in the first half of this, and then something changes. Yes. And the whole game now opens up to a new deal. And so that, that was, this is what's cool about having, being in a university and being able to have these conversations that he started talking about that. And I immediately, because writers have this larcenous imagination, like I was talking about, <laughs> I immediately needed to figure out how I could steal that and put it to use in, in a thing I was working on. So cool. Well, we have one more, probably time for one more song. And as I said, I did a little, I mean, you guys are both such music fans. I just was like, what am I going to play for them? And, but I did a little deep dive in your Twitter and, um, you weren't talking about dire straits, but you <laughs> said dire straits in a, com in a comparison to, uh, or reply back to somebody and, uh, uh, talking about something. And so I thought, oh, well, let's get some dire straits. You can't go wrong with that. So my teenage son is going to love this because he is hooked on straits. Right oh, now. well, then this is for him. We're going to listen to Walk of Life. The book we're talking about is Picnic in the Ruins by author Todd Peterson. You're listening to the Apex Hour, KSUU Thunder 91.1.
Well, welcome back to the Apex Hour. That is Walk of Life by Dire Straits, which, by the way, we were just talking about how that is something that that you can play as the end credits for like (laughs) any movie ever. And apparently that's a thing, I guess. It's true. It's true. (laughs) Well, okay, we are here with author Todd Peterson, who is also an SCU faculty member who we are so proud of, along with another SCU faculty member that we are so proud of, Kyle Bishop. Welcome back, guys. I'd love to, in the few minutes that we have left, talk to you a bit about um, where we can find the book, how we can get the book, what, you know, what kinds of things are going on locally for our local audience? Um, Yeah, I just found out from our own library that there are a number of copies here at the SU library, share it library, so you can get it there. Um, We just verified that there are copies uh, down at Main Street Books, where there was five of them down there. Um, And also, it's really fun, the Iron County... Uh, Brian Head Tourism Bureau is also um, has the book available down there, and they're going to be. I'm going to be doing some uh, an event, I guess, with Maria Twitchell, the director, cool. uh, in May when the tourism season gets a little bit closer to opening. We hope. Um, so there's lots of ways that you can find it, or you know, if people are listening and they're listening from afar, just go order from a, a local bookseller if you can, and they'll bring it in, and that helps everybody, including the local bookseller. Yeah, we definitely want to be supporting, uh, you know, local as much as we can. And I'm telling you, everyone, I I read it so fast. I was so, I just couldn't, I really couldn't put it down. It was so fun and it just kept me engaged. And I laughed out loud a couple times and I just loved all the characters. I mean, I thoroughly 100% enjoyed it and I've recommended it to so many people in the last week since I finished it. It was so great. Well, thank you. It's kind. Well, and then I guess one question I I was uh, wanting to ask you is that uh, before we get to our last favorite question about what's turning us on, I want to know, you know, who should we read? Let's say we we just read Picnic in the Ruins or somebody listens to the podcast, goes, reads Picnic in the Ruins. Anything you guys could suggest that we should read next if we want another fix? 
Mm. If you want <laughs> funny crime, yeah. I would say take a look at William Boyle. Okay. Um, a book that I'm just starting of his at the recommendation of my agent um, was uh, A Friend is a Gift You Give to Yourself, which is a, kind of a, just a hilarious people-centered, <laughs> character-centered crime novel by William Boyle, who's uh, pretty fantastic. Oh, that sounds great. Um, but Kyle maybe has some ideas, too. If you want a really sober connection, uh, No Country for Old Men. Oh, yeah. Which is all through this thing. Yeah. But yes. in a much funnier way. Even a hashtag. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I just taught a Willa Cather course. And, and this is, bears some similarity to both the professor's house and in a much different way to Death Comes for the Archbishop. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for those recommendations because I'm I'm kind of like wanting more. I really want more. Um, and that brings us to our last question, which I love to ask, which is just kind of like about what's turning you on. It could be a book. It could be a movie. It could be a TV show. It could be anything you want. But you guys always are into such cool things. I want to ask you, Todd and Kyle, what's turning you on this week? So, Todd, what's turning you on this week? I have a lame answer, which is I'm really getting into Dr. TikTok. Oh, I, don't I don't know, know if you've is. seen it, but there's this amazing a whole string of, of physicians who are helping people understand vaccines oh. and how things work and why your neck is all stretched out and whatever. It's just fascinating. But I think at a more serious level, because I just love crime, there's a new Netflix series called Lupin. And it's a, what's it called? Lupin. Okay. L U P I N. And it's a oh, five yes. it's amazing. It's this five ser episode uh series about uh an a French African um gentleman thief i guess that's all i'll say yes, and its yes. production value is really high it reminds you of the bbc sherlock stuff yes, yes. but it's great um i loved it my wife loved it my 15 year old son was so sad that it was older over and i love lupin and there's gonna be more oh good but it's gorgeous it's totally on my list it's like right up my alley kyle bishop what's turning you on this week well for what room i have left after lawyer kitty um, I have to say that it is crocheting. No because way. I, I have knitted countless sweaters over the last 20, 30 years, but I've never crocheted before. So I took it upon myself to make an afghan. All and right. I'm finding it in these troubled times very therapeutic. I love it. What color was the afghan you made? Uh, many purples. Oh my gosh, I love it's it. It's royal. So yeah, it's something I can do while uh, consuming other media. So I'm double dutying. It's the prince afghan. Yes, That's it's the prince perfect. afghan. So um, let's not discount the textile arts uh, during our quarantining. I Well, amen to that. What a perfect note to end on. The book we've been talking about is Picnic in the Ruins. Oh my gosh, go read it. I loved it. The author is Todd Peterson. Todd and Kyle, Kyle Bishop, SEU faculty member, thank you so much for joining me in the, in the studio today. This has just been awesome. Well, Thanks been for a having thrill. us. Thank you so much. Yay. All right, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thanks so much for listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Come find us again next Thursday at 3 p.m. for more conversations with the visiting guests at Southern Utah University and new music to discover for your next playlist. And in the meantime, we would love to see you at our events on campus. To find out more, check out suu.edu slash apex. Until next week, this is Lynn Vartan saying goodbye from the Apex Hour here on Thunder 91.1.